Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome back. My name is uh, Dr. Lee Cheng Chuan. Like Roy, I have been involved in organizing the SEC since 1998, 22 years ago. I have the pleasure of introducing our next plenary speaker, Associate Professor Jason Ong. Jason is a sexual health physician at the Melbourne Sexual Health Centre, MSHC, and is an Associate Professor at Monash University, University of Melbourne, and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He is Senior Research Fellow at MSHC and is Head of the HIV, STI, Economics and Health Preference Research at MSHC. Prof Ong's research interests are economic evaluations of HIV STI interventions, including strategies to eliminate HIV antimicrobial stewardship and HIV self-testing. Prof is associate editor of the medical journal Sexually Transmitted Infections and a special issues editor of the journal Sexual Health. Today, Jason will be talk taking us through a comprehensive review on the progress towards ending HIV in Asia and the Pacific. Let us welcome Professor Jason Ong. Thank you so much, um, Professor Lee. Um, okay. Okay. So thank you so much for the kind introduction and thank you. It's a real delight um, to be with all of you in Singapore. I'm, um, transmitting from Melbourne in Australia. Um, so I don't have any conflicts of interest. Um, the outline of my talk today is I want to uh, start the discussion by asking this question, what do we mean by ending HIV? Um, what measures should we be using? And I'm gonna share some statistics around the progress in the Asia Pacific region. And I'm gonna do a SWOT analysis of, of how good um, we have gone so far. So just to set the stage, um, just globally, um, where are we at in terms of the HIV um, pandemic? So we know that um, there's uh, 38 million people living with HIV, and unfortunately, nearly 2 million people are still newly infected. Um, this was the estimate in 2019. And also, sadly, about 690,000 people have died from AIDS. In terms of our region here, we have 5.8 million people living with HIV, and also sadly about 300,000 new infections are happening each year. But you can see that the tide has turned. So we can see that um, actually our rates of new infections are, are going down, um, albeit slowly. Um, and also you can see that the number of new infections in our region as well is also decreasing, but again, quite slowly, minus 12%. Uh, percent. Um, and similarly with AIDS related deaths, it is decreasing, but also not as fast as we would like. But given these kind of statistics, there is actually optimism in the air. So this is a, a New York Times article they wrote of our response in Australia. And really that tantalizing question, can we actually eradicate HIV um, from, from Australia? So what do we mean by ending HIV or eradicating HIV? There are several keywords that um, we must understand as, as people discuss about ending HIV. And they all kind of exist on a continuum from control to elimination, eradication and extinction. So let's uh, define some of these words. So firstly, what do we mean by control? So control means that we reduce the disease incidence, prevalence or morbidity and mortality to a locally acceptable level. And that can be defined by, by each country or jurisdiction, what that level is. When we talk about elimination as an epidemiologist, we're actually thinking of zero new transmissions, um, which I think for us thinking about this in the HIV space is actually quite difficult. And so people have now moved to the language of virtual elimination or elimination as a public health problem. And I'll share the UNAIDS definition of that. Um, more tantalizing, but I think it's still, unfortunately, a bit of a dream at the moment is eradication and extinction. So eradication is the complete removal of, of HIV from the natural environment and HIV only exists in labs. I think that's, that's a bit of a dream. Uh, we have done it for smallpox, but not, not, for any, um, not for anything close to HIV. 
extinction is the complete um, eradication of, of that pathogen, both in the nature as well as the lab. But as I said, with our current understanding of HIV and the, and the kind of technologies that we have, we can't get to eradication or extinction. So let's think about more about the elimination framework. How can we end AIDS as a public health threat? So these are the UNAID sustainable development goals. And they've set a, a, quite a clear target for the world, which is to reduce HIV in infections um, by 90% by 2030, using it 2010 as our baseline. So many countries are trying to aim for that. So how can we measure this progress? Um, there are several ways that countries are using. So the first is using incidence, which is the number of new cases within a given time, and that's usually over a year. Um, and you can talk about this relative uh, drop in incidence, like what UNAIDS is proposing, or you can look at absolute numbers. And there's another um, statistic that's quite popular. It's looking at the ratio between your incidence and prevalence, and I'll share um, that with you later. So um, the tricky thing about incidence is that um, we actually don't have direct measures of incidence. Um, and often we use notification rates as a proxy. But you can see that the caveats are that we need to have very high testing coverage for the notification rates to approximate uh, incidence. And similarly, um, you can also estimate incidence by using more sophisticated um, diagnostics. So looking at incidence assays and CD4 counts. So thinking about the absolute numbers of new cases per year, how are we going as a region? So you can see that um, in our region, um, you want to be the green country. So Australia and Singapore um, should be in there as well. You can't really see it, it's so tiny. Um, but um, yeah, so th this is one way to measure progress. It's the number of new uh, absolute infections per year. And Here's the, uh, the, the relative uh, goal, I guess, the reduction by 90% relative to a 2010 baseline. So we know that many countries are kind of racing towards this. Can we be the first country to eliminate HIV from our, our countries? Um, at the city level, we know that it's probably likely, but at the country level, it's going to be quite hard. So at the city level, we know um, this is data from New York. So you can see the number of new cases in HIV is, is dropping dramatically uh, since 2014. Here is uh, similar data from San Francisco and um, using a baseline at um, say 467, they're gonna be aiming for a target of 47 by 2030. So you can see a, a massive drop and they're well on their way. Um, this is uh, data from London. Again, the blue line showing um, the number of new HIV diagnoses is plummeting. Um, over the last few years. So at the city level, we, we think that this is possible. When we look at the country level, um, it's a little bit different. Um, so I've popped here in Australia, I've just recalculated the, um, so this is not the true number. I think there's a mistake there. Um, it should be minus 18 degrees. And where is Singapore, you might ask? Here you are, you're actually um, leading the pack. So you're actually doing quite well. So you've got a minus 66 uh, percent um, relative reduction of new cases of HIV. So well done to all of you. Um, this is another statistic that's um, quite useful. And what it is, uh, we call it IPR or the instance prevalence ratio. And I promise you that this is the only formula that I'll give you today. Um, so the way to calculate this is to look at the number of new infections per year divided by the number of people living with HIV within your population that you're interested in. And what we want to do is try to get this number under a threshold. So what is this uh, threshold? So we basically want to find a level where someone who's newly infected with HIV will infect less than one person over their lifetime. Um, and what this means is we often use um, the duration of uh, someone living with HIV is roughly about average of about 33 years. So UNAIDS has adopted this threshold as around 3%. And this is where we're trying to aim at. So this is the Australian data. Um, so showing you that our IPR is below this 3% target. So we are on the way to, I guess, um, eliminate um, HIV hopefully soon. I couldn't find one for Singapore, but um, you could calculate this yourself. So if you've got a, an accurate incidence rate um, and a prevalence rate, you can also calculate your IPR. This is where we are as a region. So the Asia Pacific um, IPR is actually quite high. So it's 5.1. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done compared to the global 
uh, IPR of 4.4. So we're actually falling behind, unfortunately. So I'm going to spend the second half of my talk just to do a SWOT analysis. So I think many of you might know this is looking at the strengths of our response, the weakness, the opportunities, and the threats. And by no means, this is an exhaustive list. I'm just going to highlight some of the, the things of uh, these points. So firstly, let's uh, think about some of our strengths. So I think a major strength of our response is that we have quite a strong science. We actually know how to prevent and treat HIV. And this is uh, um, a talk given by uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci from the US CDC, um, outlining all the treatment options we now have in our toolbox, all the prevention options that we have, and including uh, what's coming in the near horizon as well. So potential for cure, vaccines, and, and so on. So it's actually quite an exciting world to be living in now, um, looking at the science. And we can truly use these tools to end um, the global HIV pandemic. The other thing that science has shown us is that there's actually um, programs that work really well. And these are, to me, it's like they're like stars shining in the dark sky. Um, kind of showing us the, the, the way uh, forward um, or that, that there is possibilities to do this quite well. And I just want to highlight one of many um, programs in our region. And this is the key population-led health services um, in Thailand, which is uh, very famous, um, I think, within our region now, which is predominantly um, lay provider uh, driven. So um, one thing I really liked about um, this uh, uh, this program is that they've been able to demonstrate the impact nationally as well. So this is to show you that 55% um, of the new diagnosis actually came from these key population-led health service, which is remarkable. I mean, it's just to show that the scaling up of these services um, is able to reach the right people and to diagnose the right people as well. Um, the other thing is um, we know that works really well is the differentiated service delivery models. Um, so this is where we put the client in the very center of our thinking as we're um, kind of uh, constructing our services and thinking very carefully and working closely with the clients about their preferences for when they want services, who would be delivering the services, where um, do they want the services, what kind of services do they want. I forgot to say at the very start that um, these slides are all available to you after this. So you can look at the details um, in more detail yourself later. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through the specific details of this, but just to show you that it is possible to use this framework, this differentiated service delivery framework, and make it really explicit to identify the preferences um, in all of these areas. This is one for HIV testing. And this is for prep service delivery. So again, you can use the same framework to think carefully about all of these uh, building blocks. Again, don't, don't worry about the details. Um, you can get these later from me. Um, this is about differentiated um, ART initiation and maintenance as well. Again, just demonstrating how practical it is to, to think about um, putting the client at the very center. So those are our strengths, but what are our weaknesses? So I think data has been good, but not uh, enough. I think we need much more um, granular data because we know that there are large variations in a HIV epidemic in this region in terms of the level of response, the epidemic itself, um, levels of stigma is quite different in our region um, dif between countries. Even our health systems are very different as well. And some countries are doing better than others. You've already seen this slide from Eamon before just showing that variation of um, the new uh, infections of HIV. And you can see again, Singapore leading the pack uh, in a very good way, um, reducing the numbers of new HIV infection. But on the other end, unfortunately, Philippines um, is not doing as well. So the other thing about um, getting more granular data is that it not only helps us understand our heterogeneous kind of H HIV epidemics, but we also need it to monitor what we're doing, our interventions. And, and help um, give this evidence um, to account for this population preferences as well. And I know that Raina Tan and uh, other colleagues are doing a lot of work in this area about preferences, and I really want to ask them to really champion th this work because it's so important to, to get that into our research and into our data. 
And we really need to get back on track, not just to reach the 90, 90, 90 targets, which we've all unfortunately failed in our region. So we only reached 75, 80, 91, but we really need to turn off the tap. These are the new infections that keep coming. So we need to actually stop all of this happening. Um, you already saw from Eamon um, a really important point. If you don't remember anything from my slides, um, this is the, the main driving point I want you to remember is that globally 62% of new infections are happening amongst key populations and their sector partners. But within our region, there's also a very high percentage, 78%. So we must stop new infections. And I don't have time in this uh, 20 minutes to talk about what else we could do, but it's not about blaming individuals, but thinking about the social, structural, and environmental factors as well. Um, we know that PrEP rollout is way too slow. Um, Australia is the only exception in our region at the moment. So we've got uh, more than at least more than 40,000 people on PrEP now, um, but uh, PrEP within other countries, it's not high enough to actually make an impact on your epidemics. And we're also not testing enough people. And we've talked about this in a previous uh, session where we need to decentralize testing and we need to get these self-testing kits to the people that need it. In terms of the opportunities, um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually an opt, uh, kind of, uh, I like to see problems in the light of opportunities as well. So one of the, the weaknesses that I showed you was that we were not, um, we have this uh, very specific uh, epidemic amongst key populations and their partners. But this is also an opportunity for us um, because it means that they are the low lying sort of uh, fruit. Um, and if we're able to impact um, this groups of people, then it will have the biggest bang for the buck, I guess, in terms of our impact on our epidemic as well. So yes, it's a weakness for us at the moment, but we can turn it into an opportunity. And COVID as well is also an opportunity because we can ride the wave of, of what's happened in COVID into our HIV responses. I'm not going to talk a lot in my talk today about this, but uh, my colleagues have written a really nice piece um, published in The Lancet um, a month or so ago, um, looking in more detail about the opportunities of leveraging um, COVID for our HIV response. So I ask you to have a look at that in more detail yourself. Um, the other opportunity that we really have is using technology. And I think as um, especially um, the smarter use of our connected networks, not just in terms of health information, but in terms of uh, delivering services like self-testing services. And also very importantly, um, uh, it's actually about building community, um, that emotional support, particularly when we're facing um, stigma discrimination in this region. And also using um, thinking forward in terms of virtual clinics, which we're gonna try to do something in Melbourne very soon and online ordering as well. So let me end off in the last few minutes just about the threats that I, I see for our region. Um, so unfortunately, stigma and criminalization is still um, a big problem for us. Um, there's still discriminatory laws, human rights violations. And we all know that um, this is, um, is, it really impacts on our access to, to healthcare. So that's this, the evidence is overwhelming and we, we just need to address this, but it continues to be a threat. Um, this is some work from the UNAIDS as well in their report, um, again, showing that within our region, there are variations of um, stigma and discrimination as well. But overall, we're not doing that well. So this is a measure they use um, to ask if people would um, purchase vegetables from shopkeepers living with HIV or not. Um, and you can look at uh, more detail about this. So they actually have nicely ranked each um, country in terms of stigma and discrimination in terms of the laws. So you can look at it in, in the link um, below yourself. And the other threat I think is finances. Um, it's estimated that we needed $5.98 billion um, in 2020, but the reality was we only got $2.9 billion. So we don't, we're not financing um, our response enough to um, stop HIV. And this is just to show the plateau of um, resources that we're getting from funding bodies. And yes, domestically, more and more countries are increasing their funding, but unfortunately, um, it's not enough. We need to think outside the box in terms of the financial models. I've just put some examples here that um, people are starting to, to think um, through. So is it possible to end HIV in our region? 
I think we need to do a few things. So we need to stop the stigma and criminalization of sexual minorities. What we need to keep doing is keep funding um, things that work. We need to keep spreading um, the U equals U message, um, keep um, funding treatment as prevention um, in terms of access to ARVs. We need to do better in a few areas. So we need to, to scale up things that work. So differentiated service delivery needs a lot more uh, funding and resources directed to them. We need to take um, examples like um, Thailand's uh, KP-led services um, and we need to turn off the tap. So thinking carefully about just uh, the, the social determinants of health, not just individual um, behaviors and blaming individual uh, risky behaviors. We need to scale up PrEP um, and HIV self-testing and more data so that we can monitor and evaluate um, our response. So in conclusion, I think that um, ending HIV is possible, but we're currently not on track. Um, some countries like Singapore are doing better than others, but in general, in our region, we're not doing that well. And in terms of the SWOT analysis, um, as you've seen, that's still a lot of work to do, but I want to encourage everyone to, to keep going. Um, these are the resources. Again, you can look at my slides later if you want to look at this in detail. And I welcome um, people to send me an email or follow me on Twitter um, if you want to. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We now have uh, time for Q&A. Um, if you have any question, you can um, submit a question. Uh, Jason, I'd like to start off by saying how optimistic or pessimistic are you in us achieving the UN AIDS target in 10 years time? <laughs> I think the way that we're progressing now, I think we will miss the, the 95, 95, 95 targets. Um, but I think if we, if we do something different um, in the next few years, then we, we'll, we can get back on track. Um, I think countries like Singapore, as I said, you're doing better than others. And so I think you might be one of the countries that might hit the 95, 95, 95. And certainly Australia, we're, we're trying to be the first that, to do it. So we're trying to beat you guys in Singapore. <laughs> yeah, but, so yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Valenti will give us uh, uh, our latest 1990 next Saturday for the audience here. Mm. Uh, the other thing I want to ask you is uh, Australia is very successful in your PrEP program. Can you tell us um, what's, what are the things that, that, that you did uh, for example, uh, did you use generic uh, PrEP or is the program subsidized by the government or anything unique that we, other people could learn? Yeah, so I think some, there are some elements of uh, success for us. One is it was very strongly driven by community. So we got the message out very quickly um, into community and community really pushed and ab advocate, um, the strong advocacy for PrEP. And the other thing is that um, that helped our response is that we got it onto our um, PBS, which is our public system of funding these drugs. So now the government is actually funding PrEP. And since then, since last year, basically in April last year, we've had an exponential rise in, in PrEP. And yep. one of the other things that we did early on was to do massive demonstration projects. Um, so five, 6,000 people on, in demonstration projects just to get people onto PrEP in the, in the guise of research, but at the same time, we're kind of scaling it up. And then we were able to show at the population level that HIV was dropping because of the intervention of PrEP. So I think we were just um, get, gathering a lot of data and, and that enabled us to get it onto our government funding scheme. And I think that's what countries need to do. Otherwise it's not sustainable. Yeah. So unfortunately in Singapore, it's still not subsidized, but I want the audience to promote our PrEP program. It's mm. available at the DSC clinic at Kelantan Lane at a very affordable uh, uh, price. All right, mm. the, uh, we need uh, more people to be on PrEP. Um, yeah. yeah, I see no questions. So I have another question, uh, Jason. I saw in your slide, you talk about same day uh, PrEP. So in a, pay, in a customer, in a client with recent sexual exposure, uh, I know you'll do the fourth generation uh, screening, but would you do the HIV viral load or do you give the patient a one month of PET followed by PrEP? What do you do in a center? So that, yeah, so that slide was actually the Thai experience. So we, we don't have a lot of same day PrEP in Australia as yet. Oh. 
Um, but I think we are convinced by some of the emerging evidence that same day prep is is worth doing. Um, so there's very little transmitted um, infections. I guess you need to look at your setting it, um, specifically, but there is very little harm in trying to get people onto prep as fast as you can. And we found that um, from the evidence that I've seen, the retention rates of, of people that started on same day prep is a lot higher than kind of waiting for them to come back in a month or whatever. So I think there's definitely more and more evidence to show that same day prep is the way to go. Yes. Anyone has any question for our speaker? I must be very clear in my <laughs> presentation. Very, very comprehensive. Uh, it would be lovely if we can have your slide. As you say, we, we'll, we'll have them. Yeah. So uh, if there are no questions, I think I will close this session uh, for the panel discussion again on ending HIV, uh, yep. the topic on ending HIV. Yeah, over to you. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks, Jason. That was a very interesting presentation and very closely linked to what you just presented is our next topic, our, our next panel, uh, panel discussion, but much closer to home. So can we end HIV in Singapore? Update and progress on the community blueprint to end HIV in Singapore. So as some of you may be aware, last year, AFA launched the community blueprint to end HIV in Singapore along with uh, several partners. Uh, many of our panel speakers actually have been involved in crafting their specific sections on the blueprint. So the blueprint looks at um, key populations affected by HIV, hidden populations affected by HIV and certain cross-cutting themes. And what is it uh, that we can do? What strategies can be put into place to end HIV? So without much delay, we'll start uh, the panel presentations. Our first panelist today is uh, Dr. Uh, Associate Professor Matthias Tho. Uh, he will give an update on the epidemiology of HIV infection in Singapore. So Matthias is the director of the National uh, Public Health and Epidemiology Unit uh, at the National Center for Infectious Diseases. He oversees the National HIV Registry and he coordinates operations for contact tracing. He is an adjunct professor with the School of Public Health at NUS and a faculty member of the National Pre Preventative Medicine Residency Program. So um, over to you, Matthias. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sumita. And uh, thanks to the organizing committee for inviting me to give you an update this afternoon on the epidemiology of HIV in Singapore. Let's see. So I'll wait for the slides to come on. Uh, Matthias, you can just uh, press your mouse and then try to. Supposed to share screen. Um, I, I, I'm seeing the cover. Yes, okay, all right, thank you. The slides are up now. So, this is the title for today. Right, so uh, today's uh, talk I uh, have broken into two parts. The first part will be the epidemiology, and the second part will be the impact of COVID-19 on the HIV testing services and the notification, which uh, just happened from January to now. So we all know that the earliest known case of infection with uh, HIV in a human was actually detected in the blood sample collected in 1959 from a man in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it was only in 1983 that the HIV virus was isolated and identified by researchers in France. And uh, about almost two years later, that was in April 1985, the Dr. K. V. Ratnam, who, is, uh, who was a dermatoimmunologist at the Middle Road Hospital in Singapore, discovered Singapore's first three cases of HIV infection. And after that, uh, almost about one and a half years later in September 1986, the first AIDS case was found in Singapore. And in April 1987, the first AIDS death was recorded. And fast forward up to 31st December last year, in Singapore, we have about 8,618 residents who are affected. And 24%, about 2,097 have already since passed away. And 76% of them are still alive. 
So this uh, chart actually shows you the updated numbers up to 2019. If you look at the purple line, which shows the total number of cases uh, recorded in Singapore, since 1994 or so, there has been a rise in the purple line from single digits all the way up to about 2009. There was about 463 cases for the year and remained about 400 over to about 2017. And over the last two years, 2018 was uh, 313 and, three, and 2019 was 323. So we were wondering whether this uh, drop uh, after 2017 is really significant. And uh, we also know that in Singapore, men form the majority of the HIV cases. For the women in the blue line, uh, the peak was about 45 in 2009, and they represented roughly about 9% of all the cases in Singapore. And in 2019, it has further dropped to about 15 cases, and that represents just uh, below 5%. So for the men, we have divided into two subpopulations. The red line will be for the HSMs, the heterosexual group, which actually rose and peaked in 2009 with about 241 cases and has since uh, dropped gradually to about 113 in 2019. And for the green line, which represents the MSM group, it has continued to rise to about 261 in 2017 and dropped to 163 and 184 over the last two years. So this chart actually shows the uh, percentage of late stage uh, HIV infection over the years among Singapore residents. And as clinicians, we all hope to pick up uh, cases early in the course of their disease so that uh, we can offer them treatment and uh, to have good outcomes for our patients as well. So um, late stage is defined as CD4 count of less than 200 per uh, cubic millimeter or developing AIDS defining opportunistic infections at first diagnosis or within one year after their HIV diagnosis. And uh, the figures has hovered between about 40 to 60 percent to about 2014 and remain around uh, 40 plus percent. And over the last uh, three years has been steady about 40% and with a slight increase in 2018 and 2019. <clears throat> so this um, chart shows that this uh, the, compares the two groups, the uh, MSM group, which is in green, uh, which has a lower percentage of late stage infection compared to the HSM group by about 30%. So uh, we think that this is probably due to the MSM population coming forward for uh, screening at the earlier phase. So uh, comparing the two groups again, the HSM group, heterosexual group, uh, the purple bar shows the people detected during routine care. And in 2019, it's about 70%. So much more compared to the MSMs, the MSMs, uh, they have a higher percentage of the green bar, which is self-initiated HIV testing. So we think that the M uh, MSM group actually comes forward for the routine testing um, at a more regular basis as well, and also at the anonymous test sites. <clears throat> um, this chart actually shows the comparison between the total numbers as well as the green one for the non-late stage and the red one for the late stage. So for the MSM group, uh, we find that <clears throat> um, there are actually, this is the MSM group. So there are, there's a market decrease in the proportion in the green line from 2017 to 2018 and 2019. So the peak was around 2017 with about 250 plus cases a year. Whereas for the HSM group, the heterosexual group, the peak was around 2009 and it has uh, dropped. We still have uh, more people in this group who are found to be at late stage at diagnosis. Because most of them are picked up at a routine testing. Okay, compared by the age groups, um, we find that for the MSM group, 
There are the smallest numbers in the youngest, 15 to 19 groups, as well as the one that is above 60 years old. So the majority of the cases for MSMs are around 20 uh, to 39 age groups. And over the last two years, especially 2018, most of these groups have shown a decrease. Uh, but in 2019, there was a slight increase again in the 30 to 39 as well as the 40 to 49 age groups. Whereas for the HSM group, um, generally um, has also shown a reduction, particularly for the groups uh, 40 to 49 as well as the 40, uh, 50 to 59 age groups over this uh, 12 to 13 years. Some of the groups that are, remain small, and so there's not much of change, but the majority of changes is around the middle age groups. So um, going back, uh, just a recap of the impact of COVID-19 in Singapore. So you know that uh, in Singapore, the first COVID case was uh, in January, to, uh, was first um, reported on 23rd of January. And there was also a local transmission, which led to the circuit breaker um, implemented by the government. And uh, there was tightening of circuit breaker, people couldn't go out. And um, it was only later in June that the government uh, introduced phase one and subsequently phase two of the post circuit breaker that we are in now. And showing the notification numbers. Minutes, of, Matthias. Uh, yes, showing the notification numbers of the last two years. So, particularly the orange line this year has been much lower compared to last year in blue. The only difference is in uh, the February one. So we think that some of the effect could be due to the circuit breaker um, probably from April to June. And even post circuit breaker numbers hasn't really risen very much yet. So there is an overall about 20% reduction from last year. And so based on the data till about October, the uh, projected numbers for this year could reach just about 260. So comparing the notifications that we get from the inpatients uh, in the public hospitals, we have this voluntary opt-out screening program. So the numbers since last year has hovered around 3,005 per quarter and has dropped during the circuit breaker period to uh, by about almost uh, 26%. And even for all the labs in Singapore, which uh, collects the HIV screening tests, uh, during the circuit breaker period, perhaps there are fewer who uh, visit the GPs uh, and other clinics. So the uh, number of tests has also dropped by about 34% year on year. And even for the anonymous testing, um, the GPs uh, didn't get the patients coming to them for testing. So the market drop was also corresponded with the uh, circuit breaker period of April and May. So even after circuit breaker period has increased a little bit, but hasn't gone to the numbers of last year. So in summary, I just want to um, say that the number of HIV cases has uh, decreased since 2009, which was also um, demonstrated by uh, Prof. Jason Ong's talk earlier, and particularly uh, in 2018. And we think that this decrease is contributed uh, largely by the HSM group as well as some of the MSM decreases. And um, the detection through self-initiated testing is more common among the HSMs than, uh, sorry, MSMs than the HSMs. And the HSMs are more likely than MSMs to be diagnosed late. And the COVID in Singapore now has uh, disrupted some of our testing and uh, for people coming to the clinics. So we think that the numbers right now is a bit of an anomaly and we are waiting to see what the trend will be like uh, going on to next year as well. So with this, I end the talk and I pass back to Sumita. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, we'll hear from um, Kronos next. Um, it's really interesting what you just showed uh, in terms of the data that there has been a 40% drop in uh, cases um, among MSM starting 2017-2018. So Kronos will actually give an update on uh, the uh, progress that has been made in terms of ending HIV among MSM or addressing, looking at strategies to end uh, HIV among MSM. So Kronos is a senior manager with, uh, the, uh, with Action for AIDS overseeing the MSM program. 
he worked for the civil service before uh, transitioning to the social sector almost four years back. Kronos has a graduate diploma in social work and is currently working to complete his master's degree in social work from the Singapore University of Social Sciences. So over to you, Kronos. Very good afternoon to everyone and thank you, Sumita, for the introduction. My name is Kronos and I oversee the Men Who Have Sex With Men program here at Action for AIDS. It seemed only like yesterday when I was standing in front of you presenting our plans for the MSM program at the launch of the Community Blueprint. However, much has happened in the year that flew by. With the COVID-19 pandemic affecting all of us, I'm sure 2020 has been a tough one for everyone in one way or another. On our program's front, we suffered quite a huge impact, which I will share in a moment. Nevertheless, the situation also presented us with opportunities to explore different ways of doing outreach, which in some serendipitous way is still aligned to our plans to end HIV amongst the MSM community. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our volunteers, partners, and community stakeholders who have stood by us through this difficult year. Your support has been critical in ensuring that our programs and activities continue to be successful. Just to recap, we have identified three areas in the community blueprint to focus on, and they're in the areas of HIV prevention, testing, and treatment education. To which we propose to increase the reach and coverage of the MSM population from 30 to 60%. We also aimed to increase the number of voluntary HIV testing and condom use among the MSM community. Lastly, we hope to encourage and normalize the use of PrEP amongst MSM. However, when we got hit by the COVID-19 pandemic and the subsequent circuit breaker measures, all our outreach plans were heavily affected. We were not able to hold any outreach activities for the whole year as clubs, entertainment venues and saunas were closed during the circuit breaker through to phase one. Even as bars and restaurants resume operations, social distancing and other measures put in place prevented us from conducting any shows or activities, which were the staple of our outreach programs. As a result, our outreach and condom distribution numbers for the year fell by around half, which you can see in the graph presented. In the area of voluntary HIV testing, we also experienced around 50% drop in numbers. This is mainly due to the temporary suspension of our test sites during the circuit breaker period and the subsequent restrictions on number of clients we could see a day. Generally, the drop in testing numbers was likely also the result of everyone taking heed of the call to stay home and avoid public spaces. You can see from the graph presented that the lowest number of testing was in the month of April to June, which was also the circuit breaker period. With the relaxing of measures, we hope that numbers will continue to pick up in the months ahead. Perhaps one of the more positive outcomes of the COVID pandemic was the massive amount of online content that was created. Everyone turned to creating videos and other forms of shareable content on social media. We too jumped on the bandwagon but we also quickly realized that there was an increased challenge to fight for people's attention within the online space. Not to be deterred by this, we worked with noted drag queens in the community and launched our Queen Size Kiki campaign. Through our partnership with various queens, we were able to push out educational and entertaining videos once a month. We also explored Instagram live broadcasts in the bid to reach out to audiences whom we have never gotten before. We also worked closely with social media partners like Dear Straight People to produce content as part of our outreach efforts on social medias. And lastly, we converted our physical workshops into webinars. Looking back at the implementation plan in our community blueprint, we aimed in year one to strengthen and broaden our campaign efforts by exploring new communication channels. For year two and three, we wanted to focus on prep and establishing a community-led clinic. While our overall numbers for reach and testing fell, we were in fact still able to achieve some of our plans to a certain extent, despite the COVID pandemic. We have made some inroads with our focus on digital content and partnerships on social media, and we will continue these efforts in the next two years so that we can connect with the wider MSM population. 
To better understand the needs of the MSM community, we recently concluded our Gay Health Baseline Survey and focus group discussions. The data collected will help us develop and plan campaigns as well as programs in the next two to three years. We want to focus more on young MSM who are more at risk, as well as other vulnerable subgroups like substance users. In the next two years, we will also be looking at rolling out a PrEP campaign to increase PrEP awareness amongst high-risk MSM. We will work with partners to find ways of making PrEP affordable and accessible to those who need it. With an increase in voluntary testing options like self-test kits in the pipeline, we hope to see a rise in the number of MSM taking voluntary regular HIV tests. Lastly, it is our aim to set up a community-led clinic which provides a safe space for MSM to access testing and other sexual health services. We envision the clinic to provide holistic person-centered care and will continue to explore its potential with various partners and key community stakeholders. There's much work that needs to be done and the COVID pandemic has shown to us that we need to look at new and innovative ways to conduct our outreach. We're looking forward to working ever more closely with our community partners in the years ahead to make ending HIV a reality. With this, I will hand over to Terry for updates on the heterosexual program. Thank you. Thank you, Kronos. Um, we'll take questions at the end of the panel presentation, so please do keep uh, posting your questions. Uh, we'll take them all together. Uh, we'll now move to Terry. He'll uh, talk about the high-risk heterosexual men, what strategies are being focused uh, to address HIV among them, uh, what have we done this year with the disruptions caused by COVID, and the way forward uh, should uh, the way forward of the community movement. Thanks. Terry. Terry is a senior manager with AFA. Um, he is leading uh, work on the heterosexual outreach program and he has pioneered many of the programs that AFA runs targeting this group. Over to you, Terry. Hi, uh, afternoon. Thanks for having me. I'm Terry, Action for AIDS. Uh, we, handle the hand, we handle the heterosexual program. And okay, let me get the slides up. Okay, our program objective mainly is to reach out to high-risk heterosexual who have casual sex, uh, multiple partner, pay sex. The objective of our program is to increase their HIV knowledge, increase condom use, increase voluntary testing, and of course, uh, leading to treatment. At present, the estimate population by NUS is at 360,000. Through our program, we only reach out to about 90,000, which is uh, way below expectation. Issues and gaps. Okay, before I start on the issues and gaps, uh, heterosexual, positive among heterosexual actually dropped by 50% for the past 10 years. But we still have these two main issues. Number one issue is a uh, very low condom use among heterosexual, especially those who patronize uh, entertainment establishment, indirect sex worker, condom use is always very low over at that place. And next is a very low voluntary testing. It's only 5% in 2019. We really, really need to do a lot of work to increase this percentage. And most of them tested positive uh, at their late stage. Most of them are blue collars, O level and below, uh, Chinese educated, unemployed, so these people are very difficult to reach. Even with social media, you uh, you hardly can reach them. So what what is the? There are a lot of obstacles to for them to come up for testing. Mainly the heterosexual uh, misconception, misinformation. They still think that you know they don't trust the system. Medication is still very expensive. They will be caught if they they are tested positive. So and of course uh, the last one is stigma. We have to do a lot of work to remove all these barriers to increase the voluntary testing. And to do that, we have to increase our outreach, which at the moment is only about 25%. On top of all the issues that uh, I just mentioned, there are new challenges ahead, impact of uh, COVID-19. During COVID-19, most of our program have been uh, suspended. Uh, most of the entertainment establishment, Thai coffee shops, uh, most of the places are closed. 
So we have to be very fluid, flexible, and, and adapt to the situation. Once the coffee shop starts opening, most of our target audience are drinking at a coffee shop. So we have to shift most of our program, like uh, our safe sex show traveling program, all to coffee shop outreach. So we increase the outreach on coffee shops and we will wait for further instruction. Like now bars, pubs, uh, bistros are reopening. So we will increase our outreach uh, over that area. Okay, activities. Most of our activities in the outreach is to raise uh, HIV knowledge among them. Our, our, our outreach are like uh, coffee shops, you know, Ke Thai, uh, ferry terminals and uh, safe sexual. All this has been suspended for the moment. So we have to really leverage on our social medias and online platform. Example, yesterday we have uh, 30 minutes of uh, national TV exposure on uh, uh, where it's, it's actually featuring where it's day. Uh, featuring NCID and our AFA program as well, uh, touching on all the importance of early testing, seeking treatment, where to seek treatment. So we will leverage on any program or any platform that allow us to, to share. Okay, all this uh, platform will allow us to promote our HIV testing, to increase our testing. Uh, we also bring our MTS van right to the coffee shops and the whole purpose is to ease testing, to, to, to clear all the barrel and make it easy for all the abeng and uncle to just, just come out and do tests and hopefully link them up for treatment. We also provide complementary testing for, for the HSO people. Under COVID uh, uh, situation, we, we realized that some of the entertainment establishment are reopening as bar, pubs, or even a bistro. And like what Vanessa say, there's there are indirect sex worker around there. Okay, all these indirect sex workers, they are actually work permit workers from entertainment establishment. They, they, are, they are used to be singer, DJ, dancers. So now they are waitress. They are waitress in uh, bars, pubs, and uh, bistro serving the actual sexual. Okay, what, what our activity need to do is to increase our outreach from 25% to 60% in uh, three years, increase voluntary testing, reduce the stigma, and all this will hopefully uh, reduce the burden in healthcare system and healthcare costs. Uh, I think that's all for my slide. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you, Terry. Um, I think we'll, we have a lot of questions coming up, so we'll take all of them uh, at the end. A very interesting presentation. Of course, COVID has thrown spanners on our plans, but nevertheless, there are ways which we are working to overcome these. Our next presenter for um, is Jonathan T. Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan T. Jonathan was actually involved in uh, crafting the section on strengthening the community workforce. He is, a, he is a medical practitioner at Dr. Tan and Partners, a clinic that provides HIV and STI services. Jonathan has a special interest in men's health, HIV and sexual health. Um, and over to you, Jonathan. And he really is looking forward to strengthening primary care in Singapore. Hi, Sumita. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, so my section is just a quick update to our community workforce sector. Not sure. Okay, so primary objectives with this uh, section would be to build up the cap capacity of HIV community-based medical workforce in Singapore and to help develop uh, some policies, guidelines, and backbone resources to focus on expanding uh, especially HIV anonymous testing facilities, uh, education and outreach, and of course expanding access to PrEP and support treatment for people living with HIV. So our main proposed activities would be to first set up a medical advisory committee uh, whose aim is then to develop the policies that I mentioned, uh, then to build up and train a pool of, of medical directors in the community to oversee these private uh, medical providers and help to conduct some audits and ensure consistent quality of care, consistent messaging. We've um, shortlisted a few physicians and GPs and other stakeholders. But again, with COVID, uh, this has been delayed. 
So we're aiming to contact and set up sometime next year and organize uh, the series of guidelines to standardize uh, our competence and our work processes for, for uh, primary healthcare providers, especially. Um, so we'd also want to approach MOH and increase the number of designated anonymous HIV testing sites from 10 to hopefully 30 over the next three years. Uh, and, and then also organize some formal structured training programs for more uh, GPs and primary care providers to be able to dispense PrEP and co-manage people living with HIV. So we actually have a, um, uh, for example, the PrEP prescribers course, which has been organized in uh, on December 12th, I believe, which has over uh, 400 signups already, which is gonna be an online webinar uh, targeted at uh, targeted at healthcare providers in the community that can give them a, an outline or some guidance about how they can become a PrEP prescriber as well. So that's something we're looking forward to a lot. Um, a lot of talk in just today about HIV and STD self-testing. So these can either be performed on site at clinics or like express clinics. Uh, during the first part of the webinar, you know, uh, you, you, some people were mentioning about having a small clinic with a little room or two and uh, uh, some patients can go in and do self-testing uh, and get their, their results uh, very quickly. Uh, so actually uh, we do in the private sector anyway, we've just set up an express clinic under our um, our group, our DTAC group. So we do self-testing with the HIV Aura Quick, which is obviously a third generation uh, test. This uh, Aura Quick is, uh, we have it as a, um, so it's a self-swab of the mouth and then we have uh, uh, the patient sees the result and is able to either uh, 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 read the, the result, we have instructions on how to interpret, or if they want, we can have a picture taken and sent to one of our doctors in clinic uh, to, to interpret the result. We also have self-testing for chlamydia and gonorrhea. So literally go into a room, swab your throat, or pass a urine sample, or uh, a, a rectal swab. Uh, any of these are available with our clinic and there's no doctor on site. So the costs are obviously cheaper for uh, the patients as well. Uh, Follow-up is done either through a teleconsult or in the clinic if necessary. So if the test results are all clear, um, they'll just get a, a generic uh, text message or an email with the, with a soft copy of the results. And uh, so obviously self-testing has very good data from some overseas clinics. So our clinic, we opened a end of August. Uh, and so far, I think we have about uh, 200 plus, 250 patients or so that have used our services there. So it looks promising. And we're hoping to, you know, focus on this and, and uh, we'd be happy to give our our experience or our, our, uh, what we would learn from this to help the public sector as well with the community-led clinics and self-testing for, for that. So obviously in the private sector, we have a little uh, bit more uh, financial leeway and, and uh, fortunately we've been able to roll this out even during a very challenging time. Uh, but yeah, it's, so far the numbers are promising and we, we're hoping that uh, we can get a few more of these sites available uh, across the across the country. Um, okay, so that's my update. Thank you very much. Back to Sumita. Um, thanks, Jonathan. We'll come back to the questions at the end of the panel session. Our last speaker today is Alaric. Alaric is the founder of Greenhouse, a substance addiction recovery center for marginalized and vulnerable communities. Having gone through a similar experience, Alaric has widely spoken about his own personal experience and he advocates for, the, uh, for addiction to be viewed both as a mental health and a public health issue. So he will give an update on strategies to end HIV among uh, persons who use drugs. Over to you, Alaric. 
Hello. <clears throat> hey, sorry. So, uh, thanks for having me today. So, like, uh, I've been asked to present on people who use drugs um, in relation to ending HIV in Singapore. Uh, in doing this, I'd like to share with you what the Greenhouse has learned this year in working with marginalized and vulnerable communities to give some context to the work that's ahead. So just some disclaimers before we begin. Um, I'm not an academic or a clinician, so I'll be using general terms during this presentation. There may be some loss of precision. Um, rather than make broad assumptions about all drug users, I'll actually be sharing like aggregate information on greenhouse clients so that we can draw our own conclusions. So this is extract from our community blueprint, um, the section on people use drugs. Um, so we've actually like pinned down what is that we want to do. And I think it's going to be very helpful for us to implement them. I find it uh, especially wonderful that like we arrived at this together after much discussion. Uh, but since we know what to do already, I think this, this presentation will be a bit more about like uh, why drug use is happening, uh, why it's important for us to address it, as well as uh, how we can go about addressing it. So our agenda for today, we're going to look at some demographics to understand drug use better, look at what the recovery process is like and make some recommendations based on that. For those of you who are not familiar with the Greenhouse, we are a substance addiction recovery center. Uh, basically, we support people who are like sexual minorities, racial minorities, those who are HIV positive, formerly incarcerated and trauma survivors, um, including the physically, and physically abused and sexually assaulted. Uh, we have supported quite a lot of people over the past three and a uh, half years and we recently started supporting like friends, family and lovers of people who use drugs also. It's actually really difficult for our clients to knock on our door and ask for help. Um, there are many barriers to care that they're experiencing. Essentially, this is why all of the greenhouse programs and services are completely free of charge uh, until some of these barriers to care have been overcome, we need to be quite strategic. So this um, information is actually taken from a chat group that we have, seven people, 70 people who are active in recovery right now. Uh, as you can see, like most of our clients are gay men with chemsex issues, meaning like sexualized drug use. Uh, and this demographic, they are especially vulnerable to HIV. More than half of our clients have already caught HIV. Um, the rest remain like undiagnosed or currently negative. Uh, but since a very, very low percentage of them are on PrEP, this means that until they successfully manage to overcome their drug use, they remain at risk of catching HIV and passing it on. Uh, mental health, yeah, I didn't add in the citation, um, but just to mention this was a very large and prestigious American study. Uh, those who present with substance use disorders will often present with mental health conditions such as, uh, such as anxiety and depression, uh, about 38% of them. So we actually looked at our own clients and discovered that the percentage is very much uh, similar, almost there. Uh, but since other studies have really shown that LGBT are more likely to have mental health challenges, we need to ask ourselves, like, of all our clients right now, how many remain undiagnosed? And are they actually using drugs as a form of like self-medication? So as part of our intake assessment process, we do a brief trauma history. Um, these are the kind of questions that we ask our clients to see if they've experienced them. Uh, the ones that are highlighted are the ones that pop out more, most often in our clients. Uh, want to point out like the ones that are in red are specific to LGBT and the ones in orange occur more often for LGBT. So if we look at this list, right, um, I'd like you now to guess, like, what percentage of clients do you think have had these traumatic experiences? Do you think it's like 25%, 50%, 75%? Actually, every single one of the clients that we did this for have had one or more of these experiences. The average is three. So is the greenhouse actually a substance addiction recovery center or are we a trauma recovery center? Another citation from our community blueprint, like recreational drug use is more prevalent in gay and bisexual male populations. Uh, essentially, like, are they more likely to use drugs because they're more likely to have experienced like stigma, discrimination, and bullying? The ones that we highlighted in red and orange. 
So based on the information that we just shared with you, like let's ask ourselves like what kind of assumptions did we previously hold uh, about people who engage in like camp sex uh, without protection? Did we feel that they were irresponsible and reckless? Um, are we actually asking people who are in pain to behave in a very logical fashion? Uh, and then we asking people who have never learned how to love themselves to protect themselves. This is essentially what the greenhouse has learned this past year. Previously, we were using the disease model to explain addiction to our clients and we realized that mm, it really wasn't sufficient. There are actually physical, mental and social dimensions to addiction and all of them need to be addressed in order for the client to recover. So, so far we've talked about like why drug use is happening and why it's important for us to address it. Um, now I'd like to talk a bit about like how we go about addressing it. Uh, once again, this is like um, part of our intake assessment process. We come up with a care plan for the client. It's essentially what a client needs to do in order to get better. So this client needs to um, take a HIV test because he was exposed to risk recently. He needs to see a psychiatrist at IMH for his anxiety and depression and take medication for it. Uh, needs to attend smart recovery meetings every Wednesday. Uh, 12 step programs won't work for him because there was uh, religious trauma. The mom will join our caregiver support group. Uh, he will continue with his individual counseling at WeCare, which is another addiction recovery center in Ubi, once every two weeks. And we will send him for our group therapy when it begins uh, because there's some relational issues he needs to work out, like how to get along with other gay men without the use of sex and drugs. So as you can see, like recovery is really intense and complex. There are a lot of parts to it. Uh, if the client can stick to the care plan for like six months and stay clean, uh, we can reduce some of this. If the client can stay clean for a year, generally he's going to do very well already. The most important part about the care plan, plan that we should note is that it requires us to work with at least three community partners, Action for AIDS, IMH and WeCare. So in other words, in order for us to provide holistic and integrated care, we need to start thinking about coordinated care. How can we start working more closely together and how can we share information safely? So this is kind of like another view of uh, what we just talked about, like the greenhouse has a three-step ICC process, integrated consultation, community support and customized care, trying to address like the physical, mental, social dimensions of it. Um, these are the community partners that we currently work very closely with, like EFA has the most experience with HIV, we care with addiction recovery, and Uga Chaga with uh, specific issues, for example, get and shame over sexual orientation. So as you can see, it's not about building uh, internal capacity, it's about learning how to work together so that we can provide the best form of care. So when we look at this, we can start asking ourselves, like, where can your organization come in? So this is the greenhouse model. Um, I just want to point out that even though we came up with this, uh, we don't feel that it belongs to us because it's essentially a needs assessment and we need to work together in order to provide it. I'd like to point out something that we found especially helpful. Um, the last item under start, like investing in experience and expertise. So the reason why the greenhouse is suddenly having so much clarity about what to do and how to do it is because we actually had uh, help from someone with specialized knowledge. Our director of training has a lot of experience with like um, the HIV epidemic in Castro, uh, working with LGBT clients and he's a trauma specialist. The training he provided was so good that basically um, two of our beneficiaries decided to pursue a career in counseling to help other people get better. Uh, we need to start thinking about like, do we want to provide employment for people like that? Uh, we need to be able to like engage people who are able to help us like properly understand what's happening and to provide proper care. Uh, also provide employment for people who have lived experience or addiction recovery. I feel that they're the best advocates. Uh, something the greenhouse feels really strongly about is that we should stop re-traumatizing people who need care. Um, trying to treat like sex addiction, love addiction or drug addiction with like conversion therapy. It's a lot like trying to remove a splinter from our finger by removing the entire finger. It just makes completely no sense. The science on conversion therapy is quite clear. It doesn't work. Uh, it causes a lot of damage. So looking at this model, we can ask ourselves again, like uh, where does our organization come in? What are we 
uh, prepared to try? Like, if the greenhouse were to hold a workshop next year, would you come and from Canada? Start. Sorry, like, uh, would you be a part of it? Will you come and share your experience and expertise? So this is a summary of what we just talked about. Like, uh, I hope we can end HIV in Singapore by addressing drug use in the community. Thanks for letting me share today. Um, thank you, Alarika. That was a very comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, I think like you rightly defined, and as we have outlined in the blueprint, we've identified populations at risk of HIV. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not working in silos. For example, like you just mentioned, the, the people who use drugs, there's a lot of overlap with, with the MSM community. And of course, the, the different organizations need to work together to uh, be able to really end HIV in Singapore. Um, also, we saw from Matthias's presentation that we've really come a long way in uh, terms of addressing HIV in Singapore. So this is actually our opportunity to really bring an end to HIV by working together uh, uh, as uh, uh, through uh, a more coordinated uh, approach to, to HIV. So we'll go into the questions. Um, the first question is for Matthias. Um, um, do we, uh, sorry, I think it's just changed. Yeah, so Matthias, the first question says, uh, correct me if I am wrong, the, and wrong that MSM companion is unable to accompany each other in the examination room during a medical checkup at a clinic at the moment. For establishing a community lead clinic, safe space for sexual medical test, can they accompany each other to understand their partner's health? Can I suggest? Uh, can I suggest that this uh, question actually be taken by everyone on the panel? Because I think it's okay. kind of it's talking about community I... clinics and services, so everybody can actually answer that. So maybe we'll go with you, Matthias. Then we can uh, move on to Kronos and then Jonathan. I I, I don't run any of these uh, clinics that sees the HIV patients. So, so we'll, oh, okay. So we'll stray, I, I don't know why it's directed to you, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll go straight to Kronos and then we can go to Jonathan. Hmm. So actually over at uh, our anonymous test sites, um, we do accommodate uh, couples who request to be counseled together. So um, for, for MSM couples who say that um, they would like to uh, be counseled together and take the test together at the same time, uh, we do accommodate them. Yeah, I think same same thing here in uh, my clinic. There's no issues with having couples come in together. A lot of times we talk to them together, so no issues. Okay, great. Um, we'll move to the next question. Um, Terry, this is for you. Do, do we know for sure that the HSO target audience are the same groups as the heterosexual males that are getting HIV infection? The question, do we know? So do we know that the HSO target audience, hmm. is it the groups that we are targeting, are they the same groups of people or from the same uh, group who are actually getting HIV infection? So do we know that our target is correct among oh, the HSO okay. population? Uh, from, from the feedback, uh, a lot of uh, heterosexual, uh, they get infected having uh, unprotected sex with uh, indirect sex worker in entertainment establishment. So this is a place, very high risk. Uh, indirect sex worker, as you know, they are not uh, regulated. Uh, condom use is always very low because uh, most of the clients are drunk. And entertainment establishment, after a while, you, 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 you create relationship with the lady. So condom use always drop. So this is a place where I think that we, we must always be there. One, one of the venue that we must always be there. Coffee shops, if you ask me, 40, because the, the, the demographic of 45 year old and above, uh, blue collars, where to find them? You can find them a lot at uh, coffee shop nowadays, drinking and uh, having a lot of fun with uh, the beer girls, this and that. So I think we should be there as well because this, these are the people that are very, very hard to reach out through social media. They, they are not on social media. They are not on... Uh, men who buy sex platform, there's no such platform. So it's, it's very difficult to reach out to them. We have to be on the ground uh, doing physical work. Uh, uh, people who are on, on, a, on a full bus heading towards Haptai, we think that this is the man that should know all this uh, uh, prevention knowledge. 
and then people who are getting to the boat to Bintan, Batam, I think we should be there telling them to, 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 to take caution and probably take tests. I think since we are on you, uh, we'll move to the next question. And once you answer this, we can, uh, I think Ronos can also take it on. But given that COVID-19 has evolved, how sexual services are promoted, which is mainly online, how do our outreach programs anticipate this? So, uh, for example, you know, all your programs were shut off during the circuit breaker. How would you, who would you target and how would you go about bringing your programs to an online platform? Kronos or me? Uh, so, uh, Terry, you, you, you can start and then we'll move <laughs> to Kronos. Okay, we, uh, we, we didn't really start an online program yet. Uh, we we are very fluid now because uh, uh, coffee shop is the place where all the heterosexual hang out now. So, we actually ramp up our coffee shop outreach. And now all the bars, uh, bistros, pubs are opening up. We are quickly ramping up our outreach there as well. So, not so much online at the moment. So, uh, Terry, the question is that if if things were to shut down again, mm. how would you actually create an online presence? Or how do you see yourself targeting groups uh, we, not we, uh, on on the ground? We, we have to eventually, but just that heterosexual, it, it, it's a, we, we don't have really a community. You know, like MSN, we have a community, we have a platform to, to reach out to. Whereas you reach out online, is really to general population. So we have to be very careful how we reach out online, you know, talking about condom use, talking about uh, early testing, this and that. So we will eventually start something online, but it's in the pipeline, actually. Okay, thanks, Terry. Uh, Kronos, do you want to take that? That, you know, how, what kind of outreach programs are we anticipating uh, to be able to bring them online? So for the MSM program, we have uh, been having some online presence for quite a while now. Um, I mean, admittedly, we are still trying to build up our following on, say, Facebook and Instagram. Um, we have this year um, been trying to explore working with various partners like perhaps the Drag Queens to try and tap on their sort of reach uh, among the MSM community. I think the online space is, is challenging in that um, people's attention are usually very short and uh, you need something that's re really, you know, attractive uh, and, and, and something that can go viral to really get the kind of a wide reach that, that, that everyone thinks is, uh, uh, everyone hopes to achieve. Lah. So admittedly, something like that is not um, something that, you know, you can, you can very successfully create all the time. Um, we are still trying to um, find that ma magic formula. And I think uh, over time, uh, working with uh, various uh, different partners and, and different uh, community stakeholders, uh, hopefully, we, we can uh, get that kind of reach on the online space. Um, so then the next question, again, Kronos, it's for you. Uh, does your outreach target dating apps like Grindr or Scruff, or STI rates still remain persistent? Mm. Um, I think the dating apps, they, they are commercial platforms. So I think at, at the end of it, it all it actually boils down to cost. I think if you want to do conduct outreach on, on these apps, um, we, we, have to, we have to be prepared to spend a certain amount of uh, resources uh, financially on, 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 on taking advertisements on these apps. Um, in the recent uh, gay health survey uh, that we, uh, baseline survey that we conducted, we, we actually did try and recruit participants through uh, Grindr. Um, we have also made provisions uh, in the upcoming several prevalence uh, study to recruit um, uh, participants uh, through uh, dating apps. So I think moving forward, uh, this is something that we would like to, um, you know, work further. And hopefully we can also establish some kind of relationship with uh, the, the, the dating apps and, and hopefully, you know, we can work something that, that will be beneficial to us. Um, great. Uh, Terry, again, there's another question for you. Um, mm. Understandably, the HSO program seems very Chinese straight men oriented. What's the outreach like for non-Chinese communities? Not easy, definitely. Okay, non-Chinese, you're referring to Malay. Malay community, we try to reach them, but they, they will not be seen going to pub, drinking, smoking, and you have to be in the community, in their circle to know, to know where are they hanging out. So it's very difficult to reach out to Malay community. Indian community, there's really very few pub. I think all in all, it's about three. We are, we are also reaching out to them uh, on, on, on the kind of venue. But when you say traveling uh, to Batam Bintam, 
it's a mix, a mix of Chinese, Indians, and Malay, uh, mainly blue collar. So we do reach out to the rest of the community. Um, Alaric, uh, we'll move on to Alaric for the next question. Thanks, Terry. Um, how do you ensure that Greenhouse is a safe space for people to seek help? Um, has there been cases where the beneficiaries met at Greenhouse during a support group meeting and ended up using drugs together? So what do you do when, if, if that kind of a situation crops up? That's a really good question, actually. So like we have ground rules. Uh, for people who use our services, we are very clear with them that we don't allow the sourcing of sex and drugs uh, among our members. Uh, and generally, people are very grateful and appreciative for the space and for the services, so they respect them quite well. Um, but like we reiterate them all the time, and if it happens, which rarely happens, we step in. Uh, we actually stop them from coming for services, even though we need to be very firm about it, but the safety of space comes first. Um, we are actually a probably the only anonymous addiction recovery center in Singapore currently. Uh, we don't take down any identifying information. So like um, that also ensures that like uh, less likely to have a lot of uh, worries about seeking care. Um, thanks, Alaric. Um, Matthias, I actually have a question for you. Um, you know, when you do the epidemiology, when you track uh, heterosexual men coming in, uh, like presenting late, how do we know that uh, like, it's all based on what they say because, you know, PUDs are, are criminalized. So it's difficult to track if, if they can be categorized as PUD. It's difficult for them to be bisexual men because a lot of heterosexual men might claim that uh, they are heterosexual just because of the criminalization angle. Is there a way we cross check uh, the information yes. that is being provided? Yes, so that's why um, the information is only as good as what the people give to us. So uh, we do have two teams. One will actually look at the clinical notes that the, HI, uh, the ID physicians uh, record, as well as through the interviews that the MSWs have recorded as well. So we will triangulate the data together with the ones that our contact tracers go down and uh, talk to the person with the HIV as well as their contacts. Um, so, but in general, we feel that some men may actually hide certain information, so it may not be 100% truthful as well. Yeah. Okay, um, the next question, how have current programs leveraged on the extent uh, socio-behavioral research findings to help improve, sustain, and scale up their outreach to the LGBT community in Singapore. So Pronos, I think uh, you may want to take this. So really how have uh, socio-behavioral research findings been uh, used or utilized to scale up uh, interventions for LGBTQI uh, community? Mm -hmm. So Mita, how, can you repeat yeah. your question again? So yeah. how, how have we used uh, socio-behavioral research or how do we in integrate socio-behavioral research uh, to really provide uh, services to the community and to, to sustain them and to scale them up? Okay, I think that's something that uh, we are trying to do right now. Um, so we have con just concluded our uh, gay health baseline survey. I think part of the survey is really to find out, you know, what are some of the areas um, that increases uh, an MSM's uh, risk and vulnerability to uh, HIV? Could it be um, stigma, discrimination, rejection? Um, does, is there any intersectionality with uh, drug use as well? So I think having a better understanding of all these um, psycho-emotional and, and social economic um, drivers uh, will help us really, in a way, customize um, programs and, 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 and activities that really targets all these various subgroups in the MSM community. I think for a long time, we have done very well in our broad sort of uh, all-encompassing uh, MSM programs. I think the next step really is to uh, work at looking more uh, in detail to these subgroups that uh, exist within the MSM community. And they have uh, varying needs and, and, and varying uh, levels of risk and vulnerability. So I think um, having a better understanding of, of all these uh, factors would help us uh, design programs. And of course, uh, you know, we also need to work um, much uh, closer with communities groups like uh, Greenhouse 
so that we can align you know, all our services and, and have this really um, good continuum of care uh, within the, the, the community as well. Um, okay, thanks, Pranos. Uh, so there's another question. Does AFA uh, conduct targeted outreach to mm -hmm. migrant communities and for migrants? Are organizations here able to connect people with support organizations back in their home countries as well? Uh, Terry, you can take this and then maybe I can also try and answer this. We, we don't have a specific uh, a program uh, targeting a migrant worker. I think uh, there are some other organizations uh, does that, you know, uh, reaching out to migrant workers. I think there's one year that we, we, we collaborate with them, uh, talking about safe sex, this and that. But most of the migrant workers, they do have uh, regular uh, screening. So, yeah, we, we don't have a specific program targeting them at the moment. So if I can just jump in and add to what Terry said. So mm -hmm. we do create, we do uh, provide referral services to uh, other organizations like HOME that work specifically with migrants. But we have done STI and HIV testing in partnership with DSC for migrant workers uh, as well. Uh, so there are no questions. So this brings us to and no more questions. I just want to take the opportunity to thank all the panelists for your wonderful presentations and for giving your time uh, for the Singapore AIDS conference. It's just been a great pleasure to have you all here. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll uh, sorry, there's just one more question that just popped up. So Terry, just a radical suggestion here, but perhaps the onus is on the safe, on the sex service provider to implement or even enforce a differentiated price strategy for safe sex. Lower price with condoms plus face mask versus unsafe sex. Higher price without condoms and or face masks. I'm assuming here that the heterosexual demographic is price sensitive due to income. Uh, as socioeconomic level than based on their affordability can pick and choose the type of sexual service they like to have or an extra value meal. I just, okay, I think we'll just let that pass. Um, so I think we'll, uh, we'll end here for, for uh, today. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all for the next, uh, for the next day on the 5th when we have another exciting lineup and I'll pass it on to Jing to uh, give you more details on the session our MC for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, it's Jing again, your MC for the Top Singapore AIDS Conference. We are coming to the end of today's program. I really hope you found the presentations informative and useful for your practice. Sorry about the noise. Just a couple of points before we end. We would like to request your assistance by completing the feedback forms. You can find the feedback form by scanning the QR code on the screen right here. Your evaluation will help us improve our future program. So please take a few minutes to give us your input. Any comments and suggestions will be highly appreciated. We would like to also invite you to join us next Saturday for day two of the 12th SAC. Next Saturday, we will delve into the topic of PrEP implementation in both Singapore and overseas. We will also announce our Red Ribbon Award winners through virtual platform for the first time. Thank you for your time and have a pleasant weekend ahead. Thank you.